Okay, you all all right? Man. See, our lives are in Christ. Guys, we want to... So, so this baptism, when we do water baptism, we teach that way. We teach that when you go under that water, no matter what you did, no matter... I love recovery centers. I, I told Pastor Omar since I've been hanging out with him the last two days, I, I, we talk a lot. And I said, I said that's my favorite. I, I'm sorry, I probably shouldn't have a favorite because I'm not a fa- I don't have a favorite color, favorite number. I don't have, even have a favorite scripture. About the time I think I have a favorite scripture, 20 more bombard my mind. So I always say they're in my top 100 the scriptures but people have a lot of favorite things but probably my favorite place to minister is a recovery center because the gospel's so powerful and there's so many lies in a life of recovery and the only way to break and defeat and overcome a lie is with truth right so so when i go to a recovery center there's so many flashbacks memories condemnation thought patterns there's so much stuff there's trauma, there's torment in the night, there's nightmares, there's stuff. And, and you can preach the gospel and watch God in a recovery center break chains off people's souls, minds, memories, bodies. And then we do water baptisms and people just get completely restored and healed in water baptisms. I mean, I've seen people come out of water baptisms, I've seen so many fun things with water baptisms. Because it's not just another step or an ordinance, it's a sign of dying to live. Water baptism is a big deal. It's dying to live. I had a guy the other week say, well, I don't agree with you on that. It's just, it's just water baptism, man. It's just, a, it's just a, it's an ordinance. It's a, I said, no, you're missing a grace. It's death, burial, and resurrection. It's, it's the same as the grave of Jesus. It was a big deal. It was in every message they preached in the book of Acts. Water baptism was actually a strength of the message because it was all about transformation. We make it all about going to heaven when the bell rings. They made it all about becoming a new creation. We've made it, we made the gospel to serve us, not change us. And in the book of Acts, it was all about becoming something, not just getting something. So they, they just preach water baptism all the time. They said, men and brethren, what do we do? We're cut to the heart. What do we do? In the first day of Pentecost, Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sin. Philip jumps up on a chariot and the eunuchs read in Isaiah 53. He said, who's he talking about? The prophet or somebody else? At that point, Philip stepped in and preached unto him Jesus, period. Next line, and coming to some water, the eunuch said, look, water, what forbids me that I be? That means he didn't preach unto him Jesus without emphasizing baptism because as soon as the eunuch saw water, the first thing on his mind was, water, can I do it? So the water baptism was the strength of the message Philip gave the eunuch. Ain't that something? So when you see that, you know he was talking strong about water baptism because it says he preached unto him Jesus. That's what your Bible says. You can look it up in Acts 8. It's there. Period. Right after that, the very next line, and having come to some water. It doesn't say what he preached. He just said preaching unto him Jesus, which means he won't preach Jesus without water baptism because it's a sign of transformation. It's a sign of dying to live. You know what a lot of us get tricked into? Incorporating Jesus into our life, bringing Jesus into our life, asking him into our heart instead of giving him our life. (laughs) An exchange of life. (laughs) My life for yours. I'm going to look the same featurely. I'm going to be the same height. Hopefully a little less weight, but I'll be the same, right? (laughs) Maybe you come into me and I'll be slimmer. I don't know, but I'm going to be the same, but it's going to be you in me, you through me. I'm going to give you my life. You're going to give me yours. It's not Christ incorporated. It's Christ in me. But let's get that straight. Let's not make a mistake and just bring him into our life. Ask him into our heart. Yeah, it's not Jesus incorporated. It's Jesus is Lord. Are you all good with that? This is powerful because then when you go get water baptized, what you're doing is you're dying to everything you've ever been, everything you've ever done, everything ever done to you. All of a sudden, you don't even have a past. You have a present and you have things to come. You have a present. Do you ever notice when people talk, they talk about the past all the time. Do you, when somebody's struggling, do you ever see that what they use the reason for struggling is? What I've been through. You don't know what I've been through. Sir, don't speak out of turn. You don't even know what I've been through. You don't know my story. 
And all of a sudden, we're putting all this stock in this story, and this story becomes our defense and justification for whatever it is we are, and we need ministry and help and encouragement. We ain't doing well, but that's our story. And I'm like, when does it become about what he went through? When does my story line up to what he did, paid for, and what he says about me? Why am I always subject to what I've been through? When am I subject to what he's been through? When do I step out of the darkness into the light? When do I transition from death to life? At what point do I let that thing from yesterday die and stop giving it such a stronghold? See, the Bible says I have present and things to come. Then why is my testimony all about my past? I don't even have a past according to Scripture. I have a present and things to come. He told me not to be like Lot's wife. He, he told me not to look back. Paul said there's one thing I do to lay a hold. One thing I do to lay a hold. I forget what lies behind. There's only one way that I'm going to get where he's taking me if I forget what lies behind. I pastored for years, man. People are quick to say, well, you don't know my upbringing. Well, I'm not, I, I, I hear what you're trying to say, but I don't know why you let that matter so much. You don't know my upbringing. What, are we going to share horror stories? We're going to share war stories? Look, I'm not being cynical. I'm just being real. I, I don't understand why that's so important. So my daddy didn't love me. No, my daddy didn't. He, my, my daddy, true, my daddy was alcoholic. What does that have anything to do with Christ dying for me? Well, I have a hard time receiving the love of the Father because my father never loved me. Why are you comparing God to your father? Why does that even make sense to you? Why is the church buying into that? Why are we all saying, oh, and praying for comfort? No, truth. Well, so my daddy wasn't there for me. True story. You say, well, wonder if I was touched wrong. Wonder if I was. See, what are we going to do if I start with Omar and I come across and then I come to you and then we go back through and we all tell what we've been through and we tell our stuff. And then by the end of the room, when we get to this gentleman, all we learned is who's been through the most hell. Who's had the hardest go of it. And then we have sympathy for them, but we don't have the courage to minister to them because we can't relate because their story's worse than mine. Now I don't even have access. I can't even minister because you're identified by what you went through when your true identity rests in Christ. I've heard people say, well, I drink because my parents drank. That's a good reason not to drink. How was that when they drank? Why are we buying out and selling out and buying in so cheap? Well, I smoked pot because my parents smoked pot growing up. That's a good reason not. I think some of these are lame justifications and we're buying into an identity of what life taught us instead of the giver of that life. Are you okay? Are you with me? I know I'm a little excited and animated and fired up right now. This stuff gets me revved because we're being deceived. We think what we're saying. We say, I can't receive the love of God because I didn't have a loving father. You know how many people didn't have a loving father? You know how many people didn't have a father that even had the capacity to love because they had their own issues and nobody could even help them because nobody else had... And that thing wants to roll over and just sweep out generations. And now you're going to say, I can't receive God's love because I didn't have a lot of a father. Now you have a deficit. Now you're going to do the same thing that was done to you. And then your generation is going to say, well, I can't love God. I don't can't receive the love because I didn't have it. A... There's got to be a better answer. See, when you look at me, when you look at me, you can't tell that my dad was alcoholic and never said, I love you. You can't tell I was touched wrong. You can't tell my mama was sick for 40 years of my life and died. You can't see that, can you? You ain't supposed to. Because ain't none of those things my story. None of that has to do with my encouragement level, my faith, my life in Christ. None of that stuff. That's what I was rescued from. That's what I was rescued from. That's not my identity. That's where I was delivered from. That was Egypt. I'm in the promised land. I'm not looking back. I have a present and I have things to come. Ain't about who did what, who didn't do what, and how my uncle, and you don't know what, and oh, it was so bad. I get it, and I wish people had a greater revelation and didn't live at the expense of each other. I wish nobody would touch nobody wrong, believe me. But that ain't the reality. And there's these strategies and schemes set against people. So it comes to Omar when he's just a young boy. And his scheme is to get him twisted and get him hurt and get him angry and get him confused. So that when he hears the good news, ain't nothing good about it because you don't know what I've been through. 
You don't know what, well, where was God when they were, well, how come God didn't, and what? And all of a sudden it's a challenge instead of surrender. Yeah? You ever see somebody challenge God like that? Well, if God was good, why did he let them die? Wonder if he didn't let them die. Wonder if he gave us authority to pray and believe and do all things, whatever we believe and pray and having in faith. Wonder if we have fear. Wonder if, wonder if we aren't even filled up with God like we could be. Wonder if we grab on at the last minute. Wonder if we haven't read our Bible for a while. Now we're in an emergency and we're quoting scripture. Just wonder if. I'm not being condemning. I'm being real. Do we have somewhere to grow? Are we arrived? Are we there? Why are we challenging God through the outcome of circumstances when we should know God through Jesus' life? I should already know who he is. I should already, look, my mama died. My brother fell over dead in October. I ain't sitting on a tree stump. I ain't sitting out in the woods mad and angry, can't get up, can't function, because why'd you let him die, God? I don't think God just sat there and let him die. But something happened, but I know one thing, he received him. I know he's in his presence forever. I know the blood of Jesus speaking better things over my brother. I know life's eternal in the Holy Ghost. Yeah? Do I miss my brother? Yeah. But this thing here is to far outweigh that. To where even if I grieve, it's not without hope. I'm not angry. I'm certainly not going to challenge God. I said it yesterday, when you got those last backs at God, you ain't having intimacy with Him. You ain't having communion in relationship. When you're having that kind of attitude towards God and you're just frustrated, well, I can't believe you let so-and-so die. Well, I can't believe so-and-so died. You, you, you aren't having any relationship. You're actually being tricked into cutting off the only one that's eternal and the only one that's truly good. And you say this to me. You say, well, if he's good, why'd he let him die? I say, if he wasn't good, why'd he put his son on the cross? Maybe we ask the wrong questions. Maybe we ask personal questions. Maybe we ask self-centered questions. In the Bible, they challenged God, challenged Jesus. I mean, they, cha- they never asked him a question sincere. You read in your Bible, they always had a trick behind it. They always had a motive behind it. They're asking him questions. They always had an agenda. You show me where Jesus ever answered their question when they asked him like that. You know what he said? Let me ask you a question. They said, teacher, tell us. Let me ask you a question. (laughs) Ain't that awesome? So somebody come and say, well, if God's good, they're mad. Look, I pastored. I've been around this thing. I got people coming to me. They're ticked, man. They're hot. They've stewed on this thing so long and they talked to two other people that ain't believing right. So they got their case cemented and they come to me like a spiritual attorney and they got it all laid out and all their conversations recited and they challenge you with some kind of question with animosity towards the Lord. And he sent his son to save you from your sins and set you free. Can't you see that animosity towards the Lord ain't producing anything good? Can't you look on your tree and see that you're hurt? You're pushed back. You're beat down. You're frustrated. You're angry. There ain't nothing in your life the way you're thinking that's producing life. That's a sure sign you're on the wrong road, man. You're thinking wrong. And you might not have strong conviction and strong answers, but at least look at how you're believing in the fruit it's producing and be humble enough to say, I can't be on the right track. Yeah? I just know I ain't never seen nobody tell me, look me in the eyes and tell me they were blessed when they were frustrated. Tell me they were blessed when they were angry. Tell me they were blessed when they were confused. I never seen nobody come in mad and have a case against their spouse and could tell me they were producing the fruit of Jesus Christ in their life. It just is a bondage. Come on, be honest with me. You might have a right to be frustrated, but be honest with me, it's miserable being frustrated. You offended? Come on, you ain't having the time of your life. You offended. It took over your identity. It took over your purpose. It took over your destiny. And you can have all kind of qualification to be offended, but it don't fly with Jesus because he ain't. And you might find three people that agree with you and they become your closest friends in your time of trial, but that's your support group and you ain't going free. They just gonna keep building up while you have a reason to feel the way you do, but it ain't producing life. It's gotta be deception. Now you're questioning the only one that's good, the one that created you with a purpose, and you ain't pursuing this purpose, and you're wondering why your life's dry. Come on, that's not harsh. That's just straight talk. Uh, is that, that doesn't sound mean, I hope. Come on, that's just straight talk. Come on, I could do that with my brother's sister. I could do that with my mama for 40 years. I watched my mama sick for 40 years. The last 15, she didn't even get out of bed. 
People had to change her pants, diapers, shower, wash her, wipe her down in the bed for 15 years. You think that ain't real? Well, where am I going to find a place that well, I can't believe you allowed her to go through all that? Well, you allowed it, God. You allowed it. Stop it. He allowed her to have life through Jesus Christ. And she took on the identity of a woman of God. She didn't know how to complain. She was sweet. You'd have had to love her. She wasn't broken down and beat down. She never became a woman with MS. She was a daughter of God the whole way through, right up till the end. You would walk in her room and she would shine and smile and say, Hey, hi. She didn't know how to complain. I heard a nurse one time say, You need to learn how to vent, Kay. You need how to vent and get mad at this disease. She said, Why would I do? Why would I vent? What would that accomplish? You know what, when my mama died, nurses were at her funeral. There were two doctors standing at her funeral. You show me a funeral where the doctors show up at funerals. Patient. You show me a funeral where nursing staff and home nurses and visitation nurses and people at the hospital standing at the graveside of a patient when they're dying all the time. That's a testimony. I stood there. I did my mama's funeral. Boy, I blew a trumpet loud too. I had them nurses. Them nurses were sitting ducks. They were so easy. I had them nurses crying their little eyes out in three minutes and five minutes. They were toast. I, I got up there and I said, I want to thank you on behalf of the family for coming. And I just, and I said, oh my goodness, hey, hey. And they're all ready. I said, oh my goodness, doctor, doctor. The one's the, the director of the city doctors of the hospital. He does not have the schedule to stand at mom's grave. But he's there. And man, did I let it rip. I said, I know why you're all here. Because you ain't never met anybody like her. But you think she's just an enigma, one in a million. And you'll never see a patient like her again. So you wanted to come and honor her. Because you ain't never met nobody like her. And there are... <gasps> and then I preached on why she was that way. And how she didn't take MS and internalize it and take 40 years of sickness and 15 years of bedriddenness and become that. And she always knew she was on the earth to shine and that's what mama left me with. That's why I'm a madman on this topic. Mama showed me it's possible. I never seen her complain. I ain't, come on, man. You complain sometimes. You wake up and you got a little pain somewhere and it's going to distract your day and you mad and upset. Why not this? No, not this morning. Man, I need to feel better. I got a tough schedule. Oh, my God. I don't... Oh. And then you quiet and moody. And people say, What's, oh, it's just this little pain. I just, it's all right. Let that thing stay an extra day. You're about done. <laughs> Two days in, you're like, what did I do wrong? <laughs> my mom laid in that bed for 15 years and didn't know how to complain. She lost the capacity to complain. I don't know about you, but that's amazing. You learn from that stuff. You don't just marvel at it and turn her into an enigma. You glean from it and re replay that thing in your own life. You multiply. And that's what I made loud at the funeral. Let's just honor her as if she's a one in a million. Let's follow her example. And let's become a follower of what we so honor enough that we would stand her at her funeral. That you guys would leave your busy schedules to honor a woman. Please don't turn this into some of the individual phenomenon but that's gleaned from her perspective and the eye she lived from that empowered her to be that way and understand we can all follow that. That was, her, that was mom's funeral. It felt good too. I thought, doo, 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 doo. The city doctor guy came up to me crying, crying, telling me how convicted he was. And you're right, all I was making her was an extraordinary individual. But when you shared the heart behind how she lived that way, it made total sense. He said, and when you hit selfishness as hard as you did, man, it was right between my eyes. I got some real looking to do and deal with some selfish things in my life. That's what the doctor told me. And I hugged him. We held, we hugged. Yay. Is this good? That short beach just woe is me and God, I'm so mad at you and you let my, my mom suffer. My whole life I've seen her sick. It ain't fair, God. She didn't do nothing to deserve that. I'm mad at you, God. And now I'm living miserable and separated from God and no purpose, depressed and angry and 15, 20 years go by because I won't change my mind. That's deception. Y'all good if I talk frank like that? See, because I'm sharing my own stuff. I ain't just popping off. I ain't just popping off. You can't tell me I don't understand about what I'm talking about because I'm using my own examples. 
Ain't that something? Here's what I want you to see. I, I preach this all the time. Almost everywhere I go, I might as well preach it here because it's in the Bible. <laughs> I quoted a little bit out of it to David. Let's go to Colossians 3 and look at something. Colossians 3, it'll tear you up. I don't know about you, Pastor Omar, but growing up as a young man, I never heard the stuff that I see right now in my life. No preacher ever told me that God put His Son on a cross to restore my value, my purpose, and my destiny. They just said He put Jesus on the cross because I'm a sinner. They left me with the idea that that's all I'm ever going to be. And I ought to be grateful that He paid a price to forgive me when the time comes. Anybody get that impression going to church? Like, and then and they're like, that's why He died on the cross, just to forgive you of sin. Nobody's talked about the restoration of life. Nobody talked about me being changed. Nobody talked about me becoming love. Becoming love? Who do you think you are? Well, I'm just following Jesus. You can't follow Jesus. Well, that's funny. He told me to. See, we so weigh ourselves by ourselves that we don't even realize we're so used to our own human experience that we don't even realize this. We allow that, that human knowledge, our own track record to trump the grace of God through truth that's here to change us by God's Spirit. That we can be something different because God will empower us to be if we're willing. Why would he tell you to lay down your life? Why would he tell you to deny yourself if it's not going to change nothing? Why would he tell us to become love? Why would he tell us to be imitators of God and walk in love? Ephesians 5, imitators of God, walk in love just like Jesus loved. That's in your Bible, Ephesians 5. I know it's in yours because it's in mine. Why would he say that if it was impossible? Well, who do you think you are trying to walk in love like Jesus? He's the only one that could love like that because he was God. And he, Wait a minute. We have the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. He'll quicken our mortal body. He'll empower us to be something we can never be on our own. So if I'm willing to become love and he's telling me to follow him and love just as Jesus loved, it has to be possible to walk there. If he says in 1 John 2, anyone that says he abides in him ought to walk even as he walked. Does that say that, 1 John 2? If any man says he abides in him, he ought to walk even as Jesus walked. Why would it say that if it can't be done? And why when we preach it, do even leaders and preachers get offended and try to shut that message down? And just make us forgiven and heading to heaven when we die instead of becoming something in Christ and living out life in the spirit why is that proud why is that high minded I think that's just childlike faith I think that's just believing that God made us for more than we've ever lived and what we were made to live and created to live got lost through sin but Jesus took care of sin so something has to be surfaced again there has to be something attainable there has to be something exposed that I can step back into if I'm out of darkness into the light what does that mean? If I'm no longer conformed to the world but I'm transformed by the renewing of my mind why? If the things I do, you'll do if you believe and greater things because I go to my father. Why would he say all this stuff? You can tell I read that book. It's in there. And I just happen to believe it. Don't get mad because folks believe it. These signs follow those that. The things I do, you'll do if you so if you were the enemy, what would you try to confront? What people believe. And you, you'd make sure they're cool going to church. And you'd let them gain their identity from church attendance and singing the hymns and the right songs and being a part of that church and an upstanding part of that church. But man, just make sure they don't see and ever become love. Make sure that deep in their heart there's unforgiveness somewhere and a little offense here and a little pride and a little inner turmoil. But man, they can do their thing in that church. If you were the enemy, you'd mess with what people believe. And you'd try to be the deciding factor of what a man believes. And if you were smart, you wouldn't even care if they go to church. You'd just get the reason why they go to shift. Because that's just deceptive. And all of a sudden, it's camouflage. And the fact that we're there, you ask a Christian if they're a Christian, they say, oh yeah, I go to such and such a church. We relate Christianity to the church we attend instead of the Christ that lives in us. 
Sometimes we, all we do is identify with the gift we recognize. So we have to be called by that gift or we wear that badge. That's our identity. Come on, be careful with that stuff. Your identity doesn't rest on how God uses you. I mean, God spoke through a donkey to set a man straight. God will move through a backslidden person to reach somebody. I've seen it. I've seen, I've seen a man get so moved by the gospel and the love of God for a woman in a wheelchair that was losing herself and a husband that was crying over her as he was pushing her on the sidewalk and shared the story. He was a year on the run living under bridges and, and hiding from us and we couldn't find him and he was back in the drug life. This man was growing, pastor. He was, he was growing in the Lord. And he took off. We couldn't even find him. And then I got some man calling the church how this man, something overcame him and he got this look in his eye and he started praying over the guy's wife and his wife got healed. And the guy got all backwards and got freaked out. He said he got really strange. He, he asked if I had a pen and paper. He was shaken. He wrote your name and this number on the paper, handed it to me and took off, said, call him. He'll explain what happened. Why? Because he's a drug addict in his mind. For a year he's in hiding and backslidden. He's a drug addict in his mind. And now it hits him. Condemnation and the devil. He's moving in a miracle. He, he sees a lady healed. He said, there's hope for your wife. Sir, it moved on his heart cords and took him past all that last year. And what was down deep inside came up and went, bam. See, people don't understand this stuff. They just weigh in face value. Oh, he's just falling back. He just backs. He's apostate. There ain't no hope for him. God did a miracle through that man, and people that are trying to do everything right ain't even seen that miracle. That's humbling. God's teaching us something. It's all about him. It's him. It's faith in his name. It's true compassion. You're telling me this man who's condemned towards himself can't have compassion for a woman and a husband that's weeping and he sees something, there's an answer down inside of him that's been so suppressed because his identity's shattered and Holy Ghost pushes that back long enough for him to rise up and go, bam! And then she's healed and he goes, wait, I can't, I'm a drug addict. And he hands the paper and runs. So we knew what area he was in. We ended up finding him. We tracked him down, man. <laughs> but I told the man what happened. And it fascinated me, Pastor, that this man could live suppressed for a whole year in a life of sin and addiction. And in a moment, in a moment, bam, like he'd been fasting and praying. Like he'd been in his word for the last year and ain't come out. Ain't that something? So I'm telling you, God will move through anybody he can get through to get to somebody in front of you. Just God moving through you doesn't mean that everything's cool with you and God. It just means he loves people. So you can't say, well, that guy's moving in miracles. You've seen people moving and stuff like that, and then you read a terrible thing about them. Then people's hearts get damaged. You say, how could he sleep with that worship leader? That pastor was moving in God, and he's sleeping with the worship leader. You see stuff like that growing up and it tries to mess with you, mess with your heart. And then we say, well, you know, it just keeps us humble. The heart's always wicked. You never know. It's amazing God loves us. And we soft pedal the answer. No, it means you're finding your identity through the wave you're riding. You're finding your identity through your ministry, through your gifting, through your calling, not through your relationship with Christ. See, the only thing that fulfills you is knowing who you are in Him. You can't let your identity rest in your calling. I can't let my identity rest in what I do on weekends and traveling. And so that is who I am is who I am with him. You see what I'm saying? Man. I promise you this. People get mad at me. You can't sleep with some other woman that ain't your wife when you're in fellowship with the Spirit of God. Does that mean there ain't no hope or restoration with the person that made that mistake? No, there's total hope, but we got to get him back in fellowship with God. we got to get him filled with the Spirit, because if you live in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you live in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Come on, that's face value word. Don't fight me on that. That's Galatians. You can't tell me a man's doing something like that, and he's in relationship with God and in contact and intimacy. No, he's living his gift. He's riding the wave of his anointing. 
Are you with me? Watch this in that sexual stuff. Do you think it just happened? Do you think it just happened? Do you think like they were just passing by each other and the opportunity, and they just went, fell into it and said, whoa, I don't even know what happened. Come on. You had a hundred chances to say no. You thought about it. You fantasized it. It ran through your mind. You were tempted. And as it was happening, your mind was spinning. And you were either going, yeah, 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 or no, yeah, or whatever, and it happened. You can't tell me you didn't have a hundred chances to say no and be a Joseph. But if you ain't in fellowship with God, you didn't have the strength to say no because you're living by the flesh anyway. So you're going to be an Esau and sacrifice all this stuff for one little moment of something? Come on. Let's get to know him. Joseph, don't you love Joseph in an old covenant? them men in that day handpicked their wives and they oh they ain't looking for personality you know come on them men in the bible them in them old days they handpicked their wife they ain't looking for personality they looking for curves and bumps and body they like she got it going on i want her they lining all the maidens up and they're going mm, wife they ain't dating they soaking her in oil for six months. They're getting her ready to even be worthy. <sighs> so messed up. He handpicked her. Potiphar's wife, don't you tell me she wasn't beautiful by the world's standards. Right? She coming on to Joseph. Joseph sold out by his brothers. Joseph could be mad at God. Joseph could be saying, well, what's it matter? I've been forsaken. Brothers don't want me. God don't love me. This woman wants me. Just get it on, girl. I'm just being real. She's coming on to Joseph. She was, she was looking good in the flesh. She was on the cover of somebody's magazine. She got the fan and the hair blowing. She got the skirt split. This girl, she's looking good. And she's strolling by Joseph. Hey, come lie with me. That's pretty straight. Joseph don't got even work for this. Just come lie with me. He said, ain't nothing my master hasn't withheld from me. Except you who would be his own wife. How could I do such a thing? But Master, besides, how could I do such a thing before my God? Did you hear? Before my God. You can't talk like that if you ain't in relationship. And you don't even have the strength to do that if you ain't in relationship. Men if, that ain't in relationship don't have that kind of integrity and self-control. They're going to seize the moment and say, oh, well, I'm going through enough as it is. I've had people get in those situations, sit in my office, look me in the eyes, and tell me that God did that in their life for a moment of healing. That's how perverted people get. They'll tell me, God brought us together. For, I said, well, wait a minute. He initiated the fornication like he set it up to put a Band-Aid on a bruise? Is that what you're trying to tell me? I just know, Pastor, that God set this whole thing up. It wasn't as bad as you think. I've had people in my office, it's a wrong thing to try to tell me, I lose it. I pull out that sword and I make sure I cut their heart out. Because <laughs> I don't want them believing that. And passing that crazy stuff on, next thing you know, there's some new doctrine on the earth. Well, if you can't work it out with your wife, believe God for the one you can work it out with. <laughs> Something weird out there. No, I will cut your heart out with the Holy Ghost. You can punch me out if you want, but I'm not going to hold back truth. You in my office telling me that stuff? You ought to see how I counsel behind the scenes. Somebody ain't, ain't cooperating. I asked their spouse to leave. Can you leave the room, please? Whether it's the man or the woman, it don't matter. Could you please leave the room? Just for a second. Just leave the room. Get, just take a walk. And the, and the other spouse sitting there rolling her eyes like, oh, here we go. Why is he going? Especially if it's a guy. I say, listen, man, I don't owe you. You don't owe me anything. I don't control you. You can punch me out. You can get up and walk out of the room. It's, it's up to you. But I challenge you to sit here and man up and listen to what my heart wants to say to you. And I'll call them on their attitude, their actions. I'll ask them straight up if they're really born again because there ain't a thing that looks like Christ in your life. And where are you really at in your life, man? 
for you to sit here in front of me, knowing I'm a pastor, knowing where I'm coming from, it's impossible to help you if there's no repentance in your heart. I'm concerned for you. I fear for you. It's like you're living like you're lost. Arrogance, you're going to maintain arrogance in the presence of God? I don't think so, sir. Not in that day. It won't stand. You probably ought to let it go now while you have a chance. That's how I talk to you when ain't nobody looking. Well, I say that because I'm angry. Well, I say that because I need to win. I'll say that for your sake. Because I am actually was doing okay before the appointment. <laughs> and I'm going to do all right when you leave. I'm just going to hurt for you. So I'm going to tell you the truth and give you a chance for change. I've had some serious, intense appointments, man. I've had a married couple in my church. They were coming to my church for three years. I'm doing their marriage counseling, and I stopped. I said, wait, stop. I did, we can't go on. They acting like high school kids, like it's their first relationship. She looking this way, he's looking that way. I can't even get him to talk. I'm like, what's going on, guys? Somebody's got to talk to me. Well, how to get like this? Well, she knows. She, or he, he knows. Let him start. He's the know-it-all. Well, she might as well start. She's the mouth. That's in my counseling appointment. Red flag, that thing. So I asked him if they were saved. He got offended. He said, Pastor, what kind of question? What are you trying to pull on us? Look, we've been coming to your church for three years. I said, coming to the church don't mean you're saved. Saved means Christ-likeness, and there ain't one thing that remotely looks like him in either one of you. And I'm super confused right now. So if you ain't saved, let's talk about getting saved. And if you are saved, let's repent, because if you don't repent, I can't help you, because you're both sitting here willful and self-centered, waiting for each other. And God's waiting for each of you. That's how I counsel. So if you want to get up and leave right now, fine, because we're wasting time. Or we can repent and you guys can realize that you ain't living Christ right now one little bit. You caught up in each other. You caught up in rightness. You caught up in re unreconciled differences. And your whole life is stymied and you're spiritually dry because your eyes are on each other. That's how I talk to you in counseling. I ain't trying to like work it out so you guys can work it out like grease on a bearing. I ain't there to put no grease on a bearing. <laughs> I'm messing up, ain't I? I'm messing up. I'm going to go back to Colossians. I don't even know how I got on all that. So just don't even ask me for counseling. <laughs> don't even ask me for no counseling. <laughs> actually I don't even do too much counseling anymore I just tell somebody go turn on YouTube I think I'm on there just type in the topic that you're going to counsel about and somebody probably got something posted and I'm talking about it Colossians 3 you guys there I want you to see something beautiful oh wow it's early we started early it's alright I won't keep you crazy late we already said plenty, man. We could just leave here and just be like, just go pursue God and have a relationship with Him, amen? The Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of your heart flows the issues of life. It's really important to keep your heart in a healthy place. Get the why behind your life clean. The motive, the reason for being. See, I used to wake up with no purpose. I used to wake up and not even think about why I was alive. I would wake up and just live my day, just pursue my day, my, my desires, now I understand why I'm alive. Life's not dry anymore. Life's not a grind. People have a lot of phrases for life that don't sound good. Life's a this, a bleep, a blank. No, life's a gift. But if you're living it outside of why you're here, no wonder there's no grace in your life. Why would God empower you to live what you were never created for? It's pretty simple. So watch this. It says, if, if then you were raised with Christ... That word if is a little Greek word that actually means since. Since you were raised with Christ. So you were raised with Christ. Seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Verse 2, amazing. He strengthens what he just said. Set your mind on things above. Not on the things of the earth. Isn't that amazing? That's a seek ye first the kingdom of God thought. That's seeking things from the perspective of God, the wisdom of God, the mind of God, the heart of God, the motive of God. Don't get caught up and entangled in the affairs of this life, right? 
uh, he wrote to Timothy, he said, no soldier enlisted in the army of God ever again entangles himself in the affairs of this life in order that he might please the one who enlisted him. Ain't that something? So here's what I want you to really see this. Well, I want you to see this whole thing. But well, watch this. For you died. See, you never, you never prayed a prayer to go to heaven. You, if you just prayed a prayer to go to heaven... I want you to rethink that. And it's good to be forgiven. It's good to be sorry for your sins and believe you're forgiven and believe your name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm all for that. I think that's great. But that's a tiny little scratch and piece of the story. Because watch this. You died. See, when I went to church and got baptized at age 12, nobody told me I died. They just told me I was forgiven. They didn't say I got to die to everything I am, to my own things, my own need, my own want, my own aspiration, my own lust, my own desire, my own self-centered motive. That'd be great if a 12-year-old could see that. But if you ain't telling me, you don't even give me a chance to see that. I would love to have had that chance. I don't know what I'd have done with it, Pastor. I might not have done anything with it, but it would have been awesome to have the chance. I just know I meet a lot of young people. I know I have family members that say they have a 10-year-old that says, can we watch Pastor Dan? I really understand what he says. It does something to my heart. Can we watch? I have family members tell me their 8-year-old wants to watch me on YouTube. I just know that this message can transform a life if we wrap simple childlike faith. And it's amazing how children... My granddaughter was getting older. She was sitting in a service and she was listening. She tapped my, my wife and she said, Grammy, she said, this is really good. My friends, some of my friends really need to hear what Grandpa's saying. And she just had compassion for her friends. She wasn't being high-minded or self-righteous. She didn't even understand that. She was too little. She just knew that what I was saying was on her level. She could understand it. And she realized some of her own friends were struggling in those lies. And her heart went out to her friends. Ain't that something? And she was young. I had a man tell me his two teenage boys are driving in the car. He said, I got to tell you a story. We're driving in the car, and my teenage boys knew we had a half hour to get to wherever. And they said, Dad, we got a whole half hour. Why don't you have Dan on there? We could be gleaning. We could listen. We could grow. I said, your teenage boys? He said, yeah. My teenage boys said, why ain't you listening right now? Why don't you just put on Dan on the, in this, on the, on the pipe it through the car? And I was like, what? And it just blesses my heart because it's young people. But nobody, nobody out there when I was growing up told me that this is why Jesus came. Nobody told me I was dying. Nobody said I got to die if I'm going to live. When I got water baptized, nobody said that I'm dying in the likeness of his death and dying to sin and its identity stain and memory once and for all, Romans 6. And I'm going to raise, even like God rose Jesus by the glory of the Father, even so I'm going to raise in the newness of life. It's Romans 6. I read it. It's there. Nobody told me. They just said it was the next step on the list. And I got water baptized traditionally in pictures. And everybody's like, oh. You, it's sentiment. You, you can't believe how many young people I baptize. Their parents call the church. They're livid. They're, what are you doing? Why would you baptize my daughter? I had her baptized when she was born. I said, okay, well, that's like a christening, a child dedication. That's not a believer baptism because she's born. She don't even remember it, and she didn't even know the gospel. Believe and be baptized. There's a time for your daughter to believe in her own heart, get born again, and be baptized. What you did was dedicate her to the Lord. You don't even realize what you did. I'm not violating anything you did. Why are you offended that your daughter wants to surrender her life to Christ? Because whatever you did in, in tradition and, 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 and at, at childbirth, must have stuck in some way, God. Here's your daughter wants to surrender and she's 17. And you're calling me offended because she got baptized like it crossed over or trumped your efforts when she was born. Why do people, did you ever notice how offended people get over the things of God? You, you, uh, spouses and all of a sudden the spouse gets a little hungry for God. He's just saying, well, we're okay. We're good. We don't need all that. What are you trying to preach to me for? Spouses get offended. Somebody wanting God, they start getting hungry. Family members, you get a married couple, they surrender, they go to church, have experience. Family members grilling them. What church you go to? Well, you seem to, well you're just too excited. I don't think it's real. What'd you get? Are you, did you get deceived? Are you brainwashed? What are you involved in? And they flip out. Family members freak out. My family freaked out when I got saved. And I didn't even go to a church when I got saved. I got saved at work. My dad, my brother, and all these people are looking at me like, what? Who is this? What is this? And I'm kind, and I'm nice, and I'm caring, and I'm surrendered, and I'm not sharp-tongued anymore, and I'm not mean, and I'm not angry. And God dealt with me. 
They're thinking I'm in a cult. They're, they're, they're trying to find out when I started going to church. They don't even realize the church I'm going to, they're not even responsible for, for what I... I was already that way when I went there. It wasn't their fault. But they're going to come to the church. They were going to sneak in the back and check out what was going on to see if it was by their standards and rescue me if they must. And I'm free, having the time of my life, walking in love, walking in mercy, walking in forgiveness, and they're threatened by that. And that has to be some bad thing, and I must be in a cult. My co-workers came to me four days into being saved. I didn't say a word about Jesus. I got saved. I said, Lord, I ain't going in there and saying a word about you. I want somebody to see something in my life. If they ask me, I'll be ready to answer. But I ain't going in there blowing no trumpet. I'm just going to seek you, be in you. You transform me. And I want them to see you in my life. And when they see you in my life, I'll have a solid answer. Guess how many days I went to work after that encounter? Fourth day. Fourth day I'm at work, I go in the washroom of a warehouse, washroom. I'm in there at quitting time. You, you don't know maybe what that's like. You can't even get into the washroom. Everybody's trying to get ready, get to their locker and get to the time clock. Somehow you gotta be in the front of the line. If you feel better, if you clock out first, like you got out early or something. I don't, you're all leaving within a three minute span, but they fighting and bucking, bucking the line for the time clock. I go in the bathroom there's nobody in there and I'm like what door opens one of my co-workers come in he's outspoken he's intimidating he's kind I love the guy but he has that look and he's intimidating he's gruff he likes to embarrass people publicly he's, he can be belligerent he, he just has that way about it he comes in the bathroom he walks right by me. He says my name and says, hey. And I said, hey, man. And I was just ready to say what? And he goes over to the stalls. There's two stalls. And he goes. And I'm like, what is he doing? He's looking for feet. He comes over. I said, what are you doing? Why? Where's everybody at? I said, why isn't anybody in here? It's quitting time. I thought I was all messed up. He said, uh, no, man, I just came to talk to you. The guy's... Everybody's just talking about you. And we're just concerned. We just want to know what's going on. So they asked me if I'd go in and talk to you. And they didn't want anybody in here because they wanted, they just wanted you to be free to talk to me. I said, what? He said, just tell me, man, what's going on with you? I said, what do you mean what's going on? Oh, come on, man. You're so different this last four days. We don't even know who you are, man. We're like talking. We're like, they said, me, what's going on with you? I said, well, what do you mean? I said, give me an example. Because I was like, four days in? And they already coming to me. I'm like, ar, 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 ar. I'm like rooster crowing, man. I'm like, woohoo. And, and, and I said, give me the guy. He said, well, for one thing, you're so polite, it makes me sick. I said, well, polite ain't bad. Polite never hurt me. Oh, come on, man. He said, please don't tell me you went holy roller on us. He said, we're all afraid you went holy roller. I said, well, I don't know nothing about holy roller. But I know in that LBI on Sunday night, Jesus came revealed himself to me and changed my life oh man oh. and he stood there and tried to talk me out of this and psychologically assess me and tell me why I had some big crisis in my life and I fabricated this God to lean on because I'm too weak to walk through that's their take that's what the world believes about us because they see us fall apart Sometimes more so than them when they aren't even believers. They see us assume greater rights now that we're Christians than give them up. And now we can throw a fit and where's God been and I don't even know what to believe anymore and I thought he loved me and I don't even know what's going on. And now we throw in a tantrum and we're supposed to be believers. And they're seeing that stuff. And they're seeing Christians living like this. And they're just not impressed with that fruit. So they actually believe that we make up a God to get through our challenges subconsciously, psychologically, because we don't have the strength to just walk through. So then he told me a story about his dad. He said, my dad 
taught me my whole life that there's no God, don't buy into it. People are making money on God. They're there for people that send them in times. It's all about money. It's a business. It's another occupation. People are using each other and people are so weak willed, weak minded. They need that comfort because they don't know how to cope. And blah, blah, blah. So this man will say, the pastor, he'll go say spiritual kind words. People will cry, believe it's true, want to believe it's true, hope it's true. But it helps people in times again. So don't buy into it. There ain't no God. And don't you ever fall for that thing. He said, my dad lived that his whole life. He said he was dying in his bed of cancer. I went in to visit him. Watch his story. It's traumatic. He said he was dying of cancer. I went in a room to see him dying days, like his last couple days. I walked in, and he's got a Bible on the, the lampstand. And he said, I was so mad at my dad. I said, what? He said, I picked that Bible up. See, because when a man's facing death, he'll find out what he really believes. And he believed this, but he's picked up the Bible and he said, Dad, are you kidding me? What are you doing with this in the room? You taught me my whole life that God ain't real. And you're going to wimp out in your last days. You're going you're gonna to backtrack on what you taught me my whole life. And you're going to show up weak and weak and wimpy. And you're going to lean on a God because you're afraid to face death. You need to man up. And he threw the Bible in the garbage. Ain't that something? I was crying. He's telling me that story. That's where he was at. So now he's trying to talk me out of my experience. He said, well, we'll get you back. You'll get over this. A couple months, you'll be back. We'll get you back. People, it just wears off on people. They go through phases. That's what they believe because that's what they see. They see people, Jesus, 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 Jesus. It's probably why the Lord didn't have me running right in there talking Jesus as soon as it happened. He let them come to me. He walked in that bathroom. So he, he walked down. He cared about me. He walked out in the parking lot. Now, I know he wasn't right, but he did care about me. He stood in the parking lot for, I think we were out there almost two hours. Now, he was trying to change my mind. And I just smiled and said, ain't nothing to change. I'm brand new. I'm, I see this thing. He's real. I said, you don't understand some of this stuff. But I woke up. You don't understand. Probably baptism of the Holy Spirit. I woke up praying in tongues Monday morning. He said, why? Why? You're just losing it. I said, come on. Do I look like I'm losing it? Am I floating around? Am I wacko? Come on. <laughs> Time would go by. I'd mess with him so bad. I'd drive by him on my equipment. I'd say, hey, man. I just love him a little more today. He'd say, oh. <laughs> I go to the time clock. I'm just full of life. People all beat up, dragging people coming in for their new shift are mad and cursing and work, work, work. And I'm like, they're like, what is going on? Two and a half years in, I went on to full-time pastor. And they said, this guy's leaving all his seniority, all his vacation, leaving Teamsters Union and everything he worked for to go be a pastor. This man, he's either crazy or he's in this thing, right? Then they bump into me years down the road. I can't tell you how many coworkers I've bumped into over the years. And I'm always the same. And I'm telling you, it speaks to people. It speaks to me. It don't mean I haven't been tried. It don't mean I have perfect circumstances. It don't mean I didn't lose my mama and something else along the way happened. It didn't mean my wife wasn't struggling for a long time with her own identity. And my kids made some very poor choices and cost themselves some, some years. But never changed means something to people yeah let's live this thing man so so people got to see something in your life but it's funny see because that night when I got saved I died so I get this this is why it's dear to me I didn't pray a prayer to go to heaven it had nothing to do with my prayer my name getting written in the book of life as awesome as that is Jesus said don't rejoice at the spirits of it but, but, but rejoice that your names are in the book of life in other words you're back with the father you're one you're in the roster right you're in heaven so, so I get that and I'm good about that but that, that's just the very beginning I didn't pray that night so that would take place I prayed so I'd become the person he always intended me to be so that I would no longer live a lie or less than what he created me to be and what he paid for Come on, if you bought something and it didn't do what you bought it for and it didn't work right and you paid for it, what are you doing with that thing? You're taking it back. If you paid 125 and they said, well, we can only give you 100, you get an attorney. You pay attorney 75 just to get the 25. Just for principle's sake. <laughs> Come on. 
Ain't it something that God ain't like that? He ain't looking at us saying, man, they ain't doing what I pay for. <laughs> that, that thing looks broke. <laughs> I got to take that thing back. <laughs> I got to trade it in. That ain't what... <laughs> sorry did you ever notice this that everybody costs the same in the kingdom of God that every head costs the same you go to Walmart everything don't cost the same but you look at humanity everybody costs the same but here's what we don't believe we don't believe everybody has the same value we, we've always believed some people are more important than others some people are insignificant some people believe their own life don't really matter that's one of the biggest lies of the devil. Insignificant. My life don't matter. No big deal. I could be gone. Nobody would even notice. He would notice. The big picture would be changed. It wouldn't look like it could have looked. You see what I'm saying? But if you cost the same, you cost the same, and I look down the row, and the same price tags on every head, and it has the same price, that means every, every person must have the same value. If you cost the same, you must have the same value. Why? Because you can all walk in the light. You can all walk in love. You can all pursue His image. That's why you all cost the same, because you can all wake up and live in the same purpose. And we all need redeemed through that same precious blood. Ain't that something? But that's something we ain't never believed in our lives. And even after we save, we don't even think deep on it. And sometimes we pick and choose and have favorites and people are high and low and hot shot and low life and mountain and gutter and... It ain't no such thing in the eyes of God. I mean, he bought me with the blood. He bought Pastor Omar with the blood. He didn't say, you know, I just needed a few drops for Pastor Omar because he had it going on. But Dan, I had to shed a cup of court. It's just the blood of Jesus. Why? Because you can wake up and walk in the light. I can wake up and walk in the light. We can be one together and lock arms and be an army that's rising up because we're walking in love, showing mercy and making peace with the body of Christ. And guess what? We cost the same. Why? Because we have the same purpose. Live in Christ. Ain't that sweet? You better believe that. Or you're going to get caught up in all kind of identity crisis, insecurity, people conscious, self-awareness, low esteem. Sound familiar to folks? <sighs> okay, I got to wrap this up. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Just remember that. You died. Water baptism is a big deal. If you ain't never been water baptized, man, get water baptized and, and, and do it as a sign that I'm dying to live. Dying to live. Yeah? Get Omar to do it. He'll hold you down. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to him about it. He'll hold you down until every bubble stops. He'll have faith. And when a bubble stop, what I teach pastors is wait 40 seconds after the last twitch. And you know you got him. Now you better have faith because when you lift them up, <gasps> that's new life. And if they don't, <gasps> you know where they went, right? In the nick of time, they got right. So it's all good. It'll work out. But I tell people, we probably ought to do that. I did in North PA. I was baptized spontaneous. 17 or so people got baptized with their clothes on and drove home wet. You know God's moving in America when somebody's getting inconvenience. And they driving home crying, all wet, and it's cold out. And this 17-year-old come up, and we're doing it in a hot tub. They were baptizing in a hot tub. And hot tubs have armrests and places to sit your butt and prop your leg. And, and, it, and you go put him down, and his arm's sticking out of the water. And we put him under, and his shoulder and arm's up. And I thought, you got to get, I said, push him under, because somebody's going to think, oh, his arm didn't go under. That arm's going to lead him down the wrong road. <laughs> that arm ain't sanctified. That whole body's clean, but that arm... That's how people think. Get real legalistic. So I thought, we got to get the arm under. I said, Pastor, get his arm under. Just get his arm under. So we had him under an extra second and a half or two. But in his young 17-year-old mind, I said it's serious about the bubbles. And everybody chuckled, but I didn't laugh. I kept preaching. I didn't realize it till later, but they said, you were so serious. I actually got an email from that service. Pastor, are you serious? Do you really have faith for that? That's incredible. And I'm like, no, it was a joke. Because I said, and then if you're, if you're a good pastor, I looked at Pastor Rick, I said, if you're a good pastor like me, you're going to have faith. It's all about dying. You're going to hold them under till every bubble stops. You make sure. You get a big usher to help you or you believe for the spirit of Samson, but you hold them under. And I said, when you bring them up, you got new life. 
through Jesus Christ. And I'm preaching it. Seventy people just kept coming up. Can I get baptized? Come on. Come on. This kid comes up. He's the last one. He says, I'm so ready to die. I'm so ready to die. That's what he kept saying. I said, get in here, man. Push his arms up. Put him on. Put him on. All of a sudden, he starts pushing. He's coming up. About the time we're getting his arm and shoulder under, he's coming up. <gasps> and I said, are you okay? What? And all of a sudden I went, oh my goodness, you thought we were... He said, I thought you were really serious and I ain't ready for this. <laughs> now he come up, I'm ready to die. I'm ready to die. Okay. Whoa, he's coming back up. Surface. <laughs> so I looked at him, I felt bad. I said... Did we just ruin your whole baptism experience? Should we like double dip and do this again? He said, no, I'm good. I'm good. And I felt, I was like, I don't know if he's good. I think we should put him back down. But he said, I'm good. And he crawled out and we hugged and prayed over him. I think it was like two years later, I'm up even more north, hour and a half from that area. Might have been three years. This young man walks up. He says, hey, I don't know if you'll remember me. But I walked up in a baptism over at such and such a church. I said, the young man you thought I was holding you under to the bubbles? Yeah, that was me. I said, remember, I tell that story all the time. He said, well, I'm the man. I'm that young man. He said, I want you to know that was the change of my life. He said, I ain't never looked back since that moment because it was the night I finally surrendered and I died so I could truly live. And he said, my life has been amazing in God. He loves me. He's my father. I can't even describe the last three years. Thank you for the investment in my life. And you just stand there and you cry and you hug him and you thank him for sharing that with you. Ain't that something? Young man, 17, now he's 20. He could have been doing a whole lot of things. And all he wants to do is know Jesus more. Ain't that something? Why? Why? Because his life is hidden in Christ. And when Christ appears you will appear with him in glory. Therefore, therefore means in light of what I just said, because of this, in light of this, therefore, you get it? Therefore, because of what I just said, in light of this truth, let's do this. That's why I tell pastors and leaders and preachers, please be careful. Anybody that's even teaching Bible study in your home, don't just jump in at a therefore and start to preach. You could misinterpret it. You've got to know what it's there for. Yeah, it's not even a joke. It's, it's a truth. It's there for a reason. So if you miss the context of what it's there for, you could read a line and, and interpret it face value without... You get what I'm saying? Very dangerous. So you don't piece the Bible like that. So, so he says, therefore, in light of this truth that your life's in Christ and your mind's set on things above and you died and your life is now hidden in Christ and Christ appears, you'll also appear with him in glory. Therefore, because this is true, look what you're supposed to do. Okay, now bear with me. He says, put to what? Uh-oh. He says that in your Bible? It ain't just in mine? Is it in your Bible? Who has that in their Bible? Put to death. He didn't say moderate. He didn't say self-control. He didn't say find a healthy balance. He said, kill your life as you know it in this arena. Put it to death. And guess what he does? And I won't stay too long and get too, make you too nervous. But the first thing on the list, on every list of the flesh, Galatians, 2 Corinthians 6, 1 Thessalonians 4, Ephesians, every list of the works of the flesh, the first thing on the list is always sexuality. Every time. Every flesh list in your Bible starts off with sexuality. Why? Because it's driven by sensuality. And instead of people living by the Spirit, they live by sensuality. That's the perversion. So the biggest exploitation on the earth, the biggest counterfeit that the devil can do is counterfeit sexuality and drive it through sensuality and force sexual activity through emotions, need, want, loneliness, lack, emptiness, identity crisis. Come on. There ain't no topic on the earth more focused on 
and more exploited than sexuality. There ain't even a close second. They, they can't even do a commercial on something. They can't even do a commercial on, 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 on a fan, on a solar little unit that you put in your yard without having some lady on there. You can't even open a magazine and see something that, without something. There's nothing more exploited than sexuality because it's driven by sensuality when you don't understand the things of the Spirit. So people are emotional. Sexual appetite comes through need, want, lack. A woman feeling lonely, wanting to know she's worthy and valuable. I knew a lady that went to church, precious black sister down the city. She turned 50, lost sight of her womanhood, said, I don't even know if a man would want me anymore. I don't even know if I'm a woman anymore. I'm like, what are you even thinking that stuff for? Why do you even want a man to lust you? Why do you need to know if you still have it? What does that mean? You just want to turn a man's head for what? So he sins? You're complimented by that? But you see, it's important to people because we were trained by that thing and we under the pressure of that thing. So we're flattered by it and it triggers desire. Are you all with me? You know what happened to her? She slept with a couple of men just to prove she wasn't past her age. And you know what happened to her? She got HIV. That thing ain't got no mercy out there. She's singing in the choir on Sunday. She got identity crisis and she's questioning her age if she still got it as a woman. She thinks because a man wants to sleep with her, she's validated. No, he's just got lust. He might not even like you. <laughs> a man sleep with a prostitute and perform. He don't even know her. Don't even know her real name. Why do we get this idea that because somebody wants us sexually, it's a compliment? It's just a sign of lust and need and want most of the time. Sorry, I'm not more romantic about this thing. But Hollywood's got it all wrong. One night stands are common in the church. I've seen Christian websites, Christian dating services, their meat markets, people are testing each other out. I know a Christian website back home. There was a church that had a Christian thing, a mingle thing. And, 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 and I knew, I don't know how many people that slept together because I was counseling. Just like they don't know Jesus, just like the world. Just See, he said, since this is your life in Christ, look at the first thing he said. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. What's the first thing he said? Fornication. It's any sexual activity outside of marriage. Fornication. You say, well, we, we do stuff, we just don't do it. It's all fornication. It's all sexual desire. I did the, remember, I touched her shoulder this morning and I said, it's not good to touch a woman. He means with desire. That's not your wife. You don't touch her with, with desire. It's not good, right? He says, put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication, passion, evil desire uncleanness what's he talking about the way we all grew up sexually it's sex drive it's all self-centered self-serving it's all about me we say it's all about you baby but it's all about me most of the time i love you means i need you that's why the words i love you have caused so much pain i'm sorry i wish i could be more positive on this thing but this thing needs exposed See, because people need love. They need to feel love. They need to believe they're lovable. So the words, I love you, win. But the reason we need all that is because we're not receiving God's love. We're not being fulfilled through His love so we can become love, so we're still in need of love. See, when He made Adam in His image, He made Adam to love. When Adam ate the tree and everything died, He became in need of love. He went from being love to needing love. Jesus said, if you come after me, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me, and the goal of your instruction is love. And if God loved us this way, ought you not love one another? So now as a Christian, my highest goal is to love you, not be loved by you. Are you with me? That ends my hurt, my frustration, my disappointment, my discouragement. Why? Because I didn't wake up to be loved by you. Now I'm only as good as you're loving me. I woke up loved by him and ready to love you. And ain't nobody can stop that. You get it? 
That's why when my wife went into identity crisis for about eight years and I couldn't reach her because she's believing one lie, one silly lie that turned into a torment for her. A torment for her. Not a torment for me. She was my wife. I love her. I don't need her. I love her. Like Christ loves his church. You say, eight years, a long time. Why do you let eight years change the truth when heaven and earth passing away and his word's going to be the same? Why do you buy into that lie and let time change what's true? Is she in trouble if she's in that crisis? She, I was full-time pastor. She wouldn't even come to church. And I'm full-time pastor. She won't come to church because she's condemned. She ain't been around. She's believing that people say hi to her rhetorically because she's my wife. She, they just acknowledge her not because of who she is because she's with me and they love me. She got into this weird believing. It just took and spiraled and got, and I couldn't even reach her. I talked to her and she'd just look at me and say stuff wrong, stronghold believing, but she wouldn't even let me. She'd say, well, you're supposed to tell me that. Well, you're supposed to tell me that. I'm like, honey, it's true. No, you're just, it's the right answer. And it got weird. Eight years, she's hurting. Does she need help? Does she need Jesus? Guess what? He lives in me. Now ain't the time to be a frustrated, another frustrated husband that needs Omar to counsel him. And if she don't break soon, I don't know what I'm going to do because i got so much on my plate and I can't have this wife putting all this pressure on me and I don't know why God gave me this woman in the first place because he knows what i got this big calling and all this stuff and my wife ain't even running with me. And a lot of pastors will feel for him and say, man, I can't imagine being in your shoes. We've got to pray for her to change, brother. If she don't change, you're going to have to make a decision. Oh, that counsel's out there. Ugh. That counsel's out there. Are you kidding me? How am I any less anointed? How am I any less called? How do I have any less capacity to walk in love, walk in light, and shine in Christ? Just because my wife's struggling, it ought to make a greater draw on Christ. Why should I struggle? Because she's struggling. I should have compassion on her and love her. If I was struggling, would God have compassion on me and love me? Or would he judge me and write me off? Would he draw a timeline? Would he jump ship? Would God jump ship? Did God jump ship on any of you? Did he put a timeline on any of you? Did anybody make him wait a little? Mm -mm -mm. See, somehow we expect God to be a certain way, but we ain't ready to put that thing on us. He didn't forgive you just so you can walk around forgiving. He forgave you so you're so touched by it, you become forgiveness. He showed you mercy so you're so overwhelmed by the beauty of mercy that you become mercy. Amen? There was a man in your, your Bible in Matthew 18 who for, was forgiven everything he owed his master. Everything he owed he couldn't pay. He's about ready to be sold out. He fell on his knees and cried and asked for mercy and said, I can't pay you, would you forgive me? And the master had compassion on him and forgave him everything he owed him. He went out and, and threw his brother in prison for like 500 bucks. He was forgiven everything he did and everything he owed, and he didn't forgive his brother of something. And you know what the master said to him? To the servant, the man in the house, not a pagan, a servant in the house. He said, you evil and wicked servant. Bible I forgave you of everything you owed me should you not have done the same for him what's he saying I don't forgive you just so you can walk around forgiving I forgive you so you're so affected by the beauty of it the love of it and that the goodness of God would lead you to change that you would give that to everybody else because it sets you free he called that servant an evil and you know what the outcome of that servant was he was bound head and foot and in outer darkness in torment I don't believe he's cast into hell in that story. I believe it's a condition of his soul. I believe people that are living in unforgiveness are always tormented. They're always ostracized. They're always in bondage. And their story becomes their identity and their unforgiveness becomes their, and the story behind it and the facts become their justification for their unforgiveness and they find two people that strongly agree with them. And they're their friends in that season. It's torment. It's a place of darkness. Therefore, put to what? Whew. You know what he's saying? The way you grew up ain't the way I created you. 
You've been trained by the world. You've been driven by lies. You've been driven by self-centeredness. And everything in this arena of sexuality has been hinged on sensuality. And we were all marked by it from a very super, 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 super young age. Yeah? I found a pornography magazine when I was 11. I already had some questions. I already was aware of things. I see things, TV. I found some things in my own home. My dad had. There, there was stuff going on, but I picked up this porn magazine on a Sunday afternoon, taking a walk on the road tracks at the brickyard, and I sat on that train dock, and ain't nobody working, and I sat there, and I read that magazine, and page after page, and read and page, and that was my education. Who knows it was coming anyway? They just initiated me at age 11 marked me he said put that to death that ain't what I intended that ain't what I created I didn't greet you to lust and exploit and want to live at the expense of anyone I created you to love not need I created you to love not want mm -mm -mm. you know why my wife loves me so much because I wouldn't change my mind about her when she was at her biggest struggle ain't that awesome she actually believed it'd be better if she would die and I could go free. And I said, I'm not in bondage. I counsel people that were already broken for eight days of the same thing. Eight weeks, way too long. How's this going along? It's going last, brother. When's this going to end? Why ain't God moving? Well, God wants to move through you. You're just waiting for the thing to end. He's waiting to be formed in you. You're waiting for the thing to end and he wants formed in you. That's how I counsel. People come in and they say, you got to pray my spouse comes back. I say, I ain't praying that right now. I'm going to pray for Christ gets formed in you. You become something in Christ. And when God sees who he is in you flourishing, he'll have something to bring them back to. But he ain't going to bring them back to the same stuff. And I'm not saying it's your fault they left. What I'm saying is now ain't the time to fall apart. Because if you fall apart, it's an indication to me that there's more of an idolatry here. Is that fair? If you're going to let one person dictate your disposition, your outlook, your motivation, and that one person ain't Jesus, that's probably idolatry, true? If you're going to say, well, you don't know what they did to me, and that they ain't Jesus? And you're going to use that story as your justification to not look like Christ? Why are you letting one man decide who you are and how you are when it ain't the Lord? That's self-centeredness that gives us permission to do that. Does that make sense? Come on. So we're going to put off this stuff. We're going to put it to death. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness. It's all idolatry. There's the word. And because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. That means the people that continue to disobey. And this is humbling. The next verse is so nobody lives in self-righteousness or pride. Watch. In which you yourselves all lived at one time. You all lived this way when you didn't know any better. And don't think you're exempt. Everybody was driven by these same things. Some people took it to more extreme. Some people just held it secret. But we were all moved by this flesh, draw, drive, passion, desire, need, want. At some level, we were all in this thing and lived it. At some level, we had to put it to death. Make sense? In which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now, ooh, but now, distinction uh oh, you yourself. See, it ain't an order call. It ain't line up and be prayed for by the minister. You yourself. It ain't spirit of anger. It's a motive of self centeredness that it gives anger a platform to rest on. Are you following me? He said, You yourselves are to put off these things. Anger. Put it off. Don't manage it. The world says anger management class. That's what you need, anger management. Go ahead and be angry at Pastor Omar, but have such a control over it that you have it in your heart, but he don't know it because you don't show it, but it's there. That's hypocrisy. Jesus said you ain't sleeping with the woman, but you would if you had a day. You want to. Same as sleeping with her. You committed it in your heart already. He said you hate your brother. You murdered him. Jesus, that's not my message. Jesus, when you hate your brother, he, you murdered him. Why? Because you see him for what you hate about him and you shattered identity. You killed him. You cut him off in your faith. You identified him for what you don't like, what you don't agree with, what you judge, and he can't be beyond because you marked him. You've murdered him. Ain't that something? You're not supposed to judge a man according to the flesh. Why? So you can see him for his destiny. 
If I saw my wife for what she was doing, I'd have murdered her right there. I'd have left her there. She'd have been my justification for however I reacted. Now this day, we'd be a statistic of however we handled it and it wouldn't have been Christ. Is there still hope for me? Can I recover? Can I get redeemed? Sure. But it didn't have to be that way. There was an answer the whole time. Are you with me? So I cry this stuff out like a madman. Can you tell? I, I cried out like a madman. So, I believe this so much. He give me a mic. I'm going to cry it out and trust that just somebody is going to believe it. Just somebody going to believe it. It's going to make change. Yeah? Woo-hoo, that's what I'm believing. You yourself are going to put off these things. You're going to put off anger. You ain't going to be like, hey, Pastor Omar. And then be like, oh, that's hypocrisy. You ain't going to manage it and say, ooh, I got discipline. I'm angry, but I don't show it. That's a mask wearer. No, you got to put it, what? He didn't say control it. Put it off. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language from your mouth. How do I put off these things and put them to death without running the risk of getting into works and failing? That's a good question. This isn't just a list of things I'm supposed to accomplish. Like, okay, I got to do this, do this, do this. No, you have to become this. And how do you do that? How do you put off and put on? You'll see in a minute. You do it through prayer, through communion, through intimacy. Watch this. You get alone with God. Wow, Father, I was never created for me. I was never created for my own glory, my own identity, my own self. I was created for your image, your great name, for the expression of Christ in my life, for the light that you bring. You're the light of all men, and you're the light in me. I was created to reveal your goodness, reveal your love, reveal your glory. Wow, nobody owes me a thing. Father, I declare before you that I get this thing. Nobody owes me a thing. You've given me your kingdom. It was your good pleasure. I'm fulfilled in you. I don't need the accolade and the affirmation of men. I'm not looking for some kind of weird, false, smokescreen justification. I've been justified through your blood. And I stand confident in your sight. And I know you've made me holy, blameless, and above reproach. Wow, this thing is getting clear. I have no right for anger, discouragement, frustration, offense. None of these things will live in me, drive in me, and move me anymore they're exposed I see it no one owes me a thing I owe no man anything but to love father thank you for fashioning me through the blood of Jesus Christ that's how I talk when you're not looking you see what it does to me and then I can communicate it because I live it there ain't one thing I shared with you in the last three sessions that I don't live with passion are you hearing me That's why I'm so excited about it. That's why I'm so like, at least I'm convinced. You might say, I'm not sure what he's saying, but he sure looks like he's into it. (laughs) Listen, you live, you live in this thing and you, you look, 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 things are going, the circumstances are a dime a dozen. Circumstances are a dime a dozen. People doing things, people messing up, people that you didn't expect to mess up are messing up sometimes. People saying things you knew they'd never say, people doing things you knew they'd never do. Sometimes you're just in the middle of something and it's so crazy and you can't even make sense of it. And you're like, man, people, what is going on? And if you ain't sharp and you don't understand, you're going to get personal, internalize it, and it's going to begin to affect you and come out this way. Yeah? See, I'm not this way because I don't have challenges. I'm this way because of what I believe. Are you with me? I put this stuff off when you weren't looking. And I was in prayer. And it says, don't you look in your Bible. Look at Colossians. It says, don't lie to one another. Since you put off the old man and his deeds. Oh, it's right there. And it says, and you've put on the... So I want you to see it as clothes. That's why I put on, put on. When you're wearing something that's not your identity, when you're wearing something that's not your creative value, no wonder you don't look good in it. It doesn't fit you. You were never made to wear it. It ain't your color. It ain't your style. It was never yours. For some reason, you got it on, but it ain't something you'd have ever bought in the store if it was actually clothing. That's why you don't look good in it. You got to put it off. You got to realize I was never created for me. That'd be great for you to pray that when nobody's looking. Father, I realize I was never created for me. I'm not even a Christian for me. There was a time I think I was a Christian for me and for blessing, protection, provision, full fats, full barns, 
There was a time I was just all about what you can do for me and God's about to move and bring it. Woo, come on, God. But let something go wrong at work and I don't even know how to see my boss right now. I want a new job because I can't stand a boss I work for. That's just weird. God, I've been so vulnerable to this stuff. I've been wanting your blessing and I haven't wanted your heart. I want your heart and I thank you that you're changing me. Man, I just call frustration dead, anger dead, offense dead, unforgiveness. No way, not even an option. I'm done with having a grid for unforgiveness. You forgave me of everything I've ever done. So I'm going to forgive others. And I just thank you for helping me, empowering me. Holy Spirit, I welcome you and I thank you for the change of my life. My mother-in-law came home one day to my house. I mean, over to my house. She was coming around the back and I had been saved. I was rolling. My mother-in-law loves me. You know why my mother-in-law loves me? Because I love her daughter. Ooh, that's a good way for your mother-in-law to love you when you love her daughter. And when she sees her daughter struggling and she sees I didn't change, when she sees I didn't throw in the towel and her whole family's thinking I should have probably gave up, it teaches the whole family that. She comes home over one day the house. She hears me in the house screaming. I'm yelling. I'm screaming. She goes, oh, my. She said, he done fell off the wagon. He, he went back to his old ways. She's sneaking back to her car. She don't want confrontation. She don't want to walk in the middle of it. She thinks I'm freaking out and screaming at my wife. She gets out to her car and realizes I'm the only car there. She says, Kim's car ain't even here. She come back. She come around. She starts listening. Father, I love you. Father, I thank you. You changed my life forever. God, I thank you never again. Why overcome, overcome with frustration and strife and anger? God, I give my life to you and I rejoice in the truth that saved me. I'm just freaking out in my bedroom. She can hear me in the yard. And she went, oh, he ain't on no platform. He ain't wearing a mic. No wonder he's the way he is. Ain't nobody looking. And this is who he is. His wife ain't even home. He ain't doing it to impress her. He don't know I'm out here. He ain't doing it. Because people think that stuff. Oh, he just in there reading his Bible to try to make me think all of a sudden he's holy and he just turned his ways. He done lived like the devil for the last two years and now he's just putting on this holy act. And you're only saying that because you're still in unforgiveness. And even if he was putting on a holy act, you should have compassion on him and hurt for him because he's living in such a lie. You shouldn't be angry and antagonized. Because see, it's not just a sign of where your husband is. It's actually a sign of where you are. I tell people, if you elbowed your spouse when I'm preaching, I was definitely talking to you. <laughs> That's what I tell people. So my mother-in-law, it affected her. You know what she told my wife? She said, I came over to see you, and Dan was up there screaming. I thought he was yelling at you. I was leaving. I just wanted to get out of there. I didn't want confrontation. I was so upset. And I realized your car wasn't here. She said, he was screaming and yelling up there. He was up there praying. He does it in his bedroom all the time. Oh, my goodness, Kim. I stood in the back, and I listened in the content of what he was saying. I could hear him so clear. And I thought, this man really believes this stuff. And she said, it touched me, Kim. You know what my 81-year-old mother-in-law does sometimes? Calls me for counsel. Calls me for it on situations, spiritual insight. My mother-in-law, who some people, you know, she'd drive off a cliff in the car, they'd be like, oh, well, thank you, Jesus, she's saved. <laughs> I'm just saying, some people, in-laws are outlaws. But there ain't no such thing. She calls me for spiritual insight at times. She'll sit and ask me a question from the heart. Her son-in-law. She's old enough to be my mama. I don't know about you, but that's, that's a compliment. That's a testimony. So you're going to not lie to one another. Why? You've put off the old man and his deeds. And guess who you put on? You put on the new man. Uh-oh. Who's the new man? Watch this. It's in your Bible. He's renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. You see what you're supposed to put back on in Christ? Let us make man in our... What got lost through sin? The image. What are you supposed to put back on? And all we've preached, all we've preached with all our breath 
is if you die tonight and don't know where you're going, pray this prayer, and we're just trying to get everybody to heaven. And he wants us to get back to the image. He doesn't want Christians to show up tomorrow at church discouraged and everybody needing ministry. He wants us to be a minister. He wants us to have such a perspective that discouragement doesn't have a place in our life because it's not about us anymore. Can I quote a scripture for you in Romans 5.1? It's really phenomenal. He says, you now have peace with God being justified by faith. Verse 1. Now he shifts gears and ramps up. Having access into his grace in which you now stand in hope of the glory of God. Now he's in third gear. And not only that, but you glory in your tribulation. Progressive. You have peace with God. You stand in his grace and you glory in your tribulation. Why? Because tribulation brings perseverance. Perseverance, character, character, hope. And hope won't disappoint because the love of God's been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. What's he saying? I gave you a defense in every trial, a right perspective. Where you never make it about you and what you're going through and how you're tempted to feel. But who I am, my great name, and manifest to me in the midst. Ain't that something? You ain't going to do that if you don't deny yourself. If all you do is pray a prayer to go to heaven, you ain't going to make it through a trial. You're going to question God in time. What you did wrong, what door you opened, why you letting the devil, and how come you, and what are you trying to teach me, Lord? And you've got to have 20 questions. When you, don't have que when you have that many questions, you don't have revelation, so you don't have understanding, and you don't have relationship. If you've got God in question, you ain't having intimacy. If you're challenging God with questions, you ain't getting close. You're just needy. I'm not being mean, just being real. I know this is getting a little long, but we're okay. It's 8.19. You all all right? I got to try to finish this. I'm going to try to finish this. We're not going to lie to one another. Come on, why? We've put off the old man and his deeds. See, we didn't pray a prayer to go to heaven. We put off the old man and his deeds, and we put on the new man who's renewed in knowledge according to the very image of the very one who created him, where there's neither Greek nor Jews and uncircumcised, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is in all and is all and in all. Okay, now watch this. Therefore, because this is true. Okay, so when he says put off the old man and his deeds, didn't he just define them with a bunch of adjectives in two, two, two paragraphs? Didn't he say therefore put, off, put to death and he put a whole list of the flesh and then he said put off these things in a whole list of adjectives, right? So he broke down the old man. He showed you who he looks like and told you to put him off. You put him off in prayer. You put him off in faith. And then you're going to put on who? The new man. Now in verse 12, he's going to define the new man. Ain't that beautiful? So he's going to show you what you're putting on. Now watch this. This is humbling. Watch what you're going to put on in prayer. Uh-oh. You're going to put on tender mercies. You're going to put on kindness. Do you know how many people in the church ain't kind? Do you know how many people can quote the word and they're mean? Like they use it as a club. They like use it as a judgment. Like you quoting something or you say something, they say, that ain't what God meant. God ain't meant. And they mean. People that can quote the word. Some people that I've known that know the Bible 10 times more than me, they're mean. Knowledge done puffed them up. They done missed the heart of God. And love edifies. Ain't that something? You can't show me where mean leads people to repentance. But I can show you where goodness does. I can show you when you give somebody the benefit of the doubt and you believe that they're more than what they've been living and you give them that advantage of you're more than what you've been living and you give them that option that you can be more than what... And I won't judge you for where you've been because I see you have a higher purpose. That gives people hope. You go into a recovery center and preach that, people will get on fire. And the way they went after drugs with a passion, they'll go after Jesus way more. Oh, I've seen it so many times. I got people in my life that I know that were hooked and addicted big time to drugs. I know men that were so addicted to pornography, they knew they'd never go free. And they can't even imagine why they were so hooked to it at this point in their life. They're like, I can't even imagine where the draw was. When I look at that arena now, it makes me cry for people. Those same men. Why? Because they found out who they really were. And they put off and they put on. You get it? Tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering. Uh oh, uh oh. You ready for verse 13? 
bearing with one another, forgiving one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you also must forgive. See, in the Old Testament, you had to forgive to be forgiven. Forgive and you shall be forgiven. In the New Testament, you forgive because you already are. Through the blood of Jesus, you're already forgiven. The beauty of being forgiven and the mercy of God is supposed to triumph in your heart in such a way that you're so free by it and you're so touched by it and it's so beautiful that you want to become the very same thing to others. So the reason I forgive you is because I'm already forgiven. I'm not forgiving you so I'm forgiven. I'm forgiving you because I am. And who am I to not forgive you when I've been? I'm not going to be the evil and wicked servant in Matthew 18. I'm not going to live bound in, in outer darkness and tormented. Come on, this is clean. This is just clear. It's what we're called to. It's all in Scripture. Who sees? It's right here. Forgiving one another, even as Christ already forgave you. But here's the clincher. 14. But above all these things, guess what you're going to put on? Why? Because you're going to put on the image of Him who created Him. In John 20, Jesus raised from the dead. And He told Mary, go tell my brother. And isn't that amazing? The disciples hadn't done anything right. When he was talking to Mary, guess where they were? They were assembled in a room for fear of the Jews, afraid the same thing was going to happen to them. They weren't having a, a violent, spirit-filled prayer meeting. They were having a fear festival. And they all said they'd die for him, but they were all scared for their lives. We'd have probably all been in the room too. So I'm not upstaging them. I'm not downplaying them. I'm not... But Jesus said to Mary, isn't it something Jesus rose from the dead and said, go tell my brother? And he didn't say, go tell my low-life, backstabbing, two-faced unfaithful, can't trust for a lick. Go tell my brother, and it's a covenant term. What he's saying, I haven't changed my mind about them boys. You go tell them, I'm going to my father and your father. That word means come forth from. I'm going to my God and your God. That word means source of life. He's saying, I came forth from the source of life. You know how people call God, Father God, Father God, I thank you, Father God. Do you ever hear that when people pray? Do you ever hear somebody get Father God syndrome? Father God, I thank you, Father God, that Father God, you right now, Father God, just thank you, Father God. And they don't pray nothing else. They just, Father God, Father God. I said, man, if you're going to say that many Father God, you better know what you're saying. Every time you say Father God, you're saying, I came forth from the source of life. I came forth from the source of life. So you can go in your bedroom, Father God, Father God, Father God. <laughs> you get it? When you get alone in the bedroom you put off those things that you see in your life that haven't looked like Jesus you may have justified them you may have found reason to say it's okay you might have just been something you believe your whole life but you can't find it in Jesus you get alone with and you put off this thing and you replace it with who he is that's how you put on and you do that in prayer. Jesus is the best example. Go tell my brethren. You put any pastor in his shoes and let happen to a pastor what happened to Jesus from the Last Supper to the resurrection, and that's a hurting minister. That can't even get in a saddle anymore. Don't even know if he want to do ministry anymore. Who can you even trust anyway? And that's valid. We have places to minister to pastors that are hurt and broken. Instead of dare stepping up and teaching, you don't have to be hurt and broken, even in the midst of these real things. If I'm following Jesus, then I'm following Jesus. And if he didn't raise from the dead broken, and he said, go tell my brethren, he didn't go say, go tell my backstabbing Peter that I got a score to settle and I see him soon. You know, Mary, I sat there at that last supper and every one of them boys whispered back and forth and said, well, I said, I was the shepherd. I'm going to be struck and they're all going to scatter. And they all said, no, I ain't scattering. I'll die for him. I'll die for him. Hey, one of them stood up for that. They all ran. You go tell them I'll be there soon. I got to talk to them. Ain't that what we did in our lives when we were treated that way? Didn't we have a score to settle? How'd that work? 
How much life did that ever produce? Can anybody make up for what they did wrong? A spouse would cheat on a spouse. I've seen spouses cheat on a spouse and not really repent and not really take it to heart. That's a tough one. But I've seen some spouses get broken over what they did. And they're like, Pastor, I don't even know what I was. I just had some moments. I just got caught up. I just, and then I did this thing and it was only one time, Pastor. And I realized, I said, I, I can't believe I even did this. And it seemed all like I wanted to in the time. But when as soon as it was over, I got in my car and I was like, what have I done? Who knows that's possible to have that kind of brokenness and repentance. And then you gotta, you gotta minister to the spouse, whether it's the man or the lady, to even have, cause they just want to pull, well, infidelity and I can get divorced. That's what a pastor will tell you. Well, you know, they did cheat on you. You do have permission. But your heart's a mess. You don't want to do anything if your heart's a mess. You don't need permission if your heart's a mess. You need your heart right. And if your heart's right, guess what? You probably won't find that permission. See, people need to talk straight like this. Because he's talking about love. He said, he said, is it lawful for a man? He's testing Jesus to give his wife a, a, a certificate for divorce. He said, he said, is it lawful? He said, it wasn't this way from the beginning. He said, for man created both male and female, and they should leave their mother and father and cleave to one another. And what God put together, no man. So here's what we say. Well, God never put us together. Well, we were out of the will of God. Well, we should never get married in the first place. But you stood there and got married in the name of the Lord. You got prayed over. You did the little salt covenant. <laughs> you knelt and did communion. Everybody took pictures. And you looked nice and your party was amazing. Ken and Barbie at its best. And all of a sudden now you're hurting and you're saying, well, I don't think God ever ordained our marriage in the first place. People come up with reasons. They'll read their Bible to find a way out instead of find a way to love. I'm telling you, I've watched it. I'm not condemning nobody. I'm saying don't ever live that way again. If you made that mistake in this room, I'm not condemning you. Just see what you did and don't ever do that again. Because here's what happens. You bring that spouse that's broken back. You restore them. You talk to their spouse. Whether it's the man or the woman, they get hurt and broken a lot of the times. And then they can't forgive, forget. Now they're playing fantasy. And sometimes the best thing is to just talk it out so they ain't thinking what happened. You just tell them what happened. You walk them through it. It's probably more healing than them fantasizing, right? And just say, listen, that's how it went down. And I can't tell you how sorry I am. Well, I'm just hurt, but I'll forgive you. And then six months later, you get a little wordy, little tension. And all of a sudden, that other spouse says, well, I ain't the one that cheated. Just remember. Who knows this stuff happens? A year later, they get in a little disagreement. And they throw it out there in a roundabout way. In a roundhouse. <laughs> in a little uppercut. Ooh. Well, just remember, I ain't the one that... I thought that was forgiven. I thought we, well, you can't just expect me to forget it. I mean, you did it. And all of a sudden, the spouse the whole time can't see them apart from what they did wrong. And that ain't cool. That's not how God sees me. And that's how I don't ever want to see you. I don't ever want to see you for what you did outside of Him. I want to see you for what you created in Him. So what am I going to do? I'm going to put off the old, put on the new. And above all these things, I'm going to put on what? I'm going to put on love. Because it's the bond of perfection. So in John 20, Jesus said to Mary, go tell him, I'm going to the Father, to God. He comes to the disciples the same day in the evening. He walks right in the room. Doors are shut, closed, locked. He just walks in. Boop, there he is. That's a freak out. Whoa, thought you were dead. Nope, I'm standing right here. See, it's not a Bible story. It's real. It happened to people. And they were standing there, freaked out. Don't think they were... What do you think Mary's like? Rabboni, ah, here he is standing. She watched him die. She, saw, she watched his appearance disappear through beating to where if she wasn't there from the beginning, she wouldn't know it was him. That's how bad it was. The Bible says that's how bad it was. Now he's raised from the dead and he's alive. He's in the room with him. He says, peace be with you. Why does he say that? Because he said to Mary, don't cling to me. I haven't yet ascended to the Father. What's he doing? He said, but go tell my brother. Said, go on to my Father. So if he told, did he go to the Father? You know he went to the Father. What did he do? He walked out Hebrews 9. He was our priest, our high priest unto God. He walked through the priestly ritual and rule in the heavenly sanctuary. And he put his own blood, Hebrews 9, on the mercy seat. Made peace between God and man and crushed sin in its power forever shakes back to the earth, walks in the room with his disciples, so they're going to be his nucleus, his first believers. He's going to hand them the baton. 
He walks in and says, peace be with you. Why? You now have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah? And then he shows them his hands. He shows them his side. And they go, oh, it is you. And then they go, ugh. Why? Because as soon as they, what do you think happened to Peter when he realizes it's the Lord? You think they're fist bumping and high-fiving? First things on his mind is what? I betrayed him. I denied him. One of them disciples ran out of their garments. Like they tried to get away so bad that he went streaking through the trees. They were holding his clothes. I don't know about you, Pastor, but you ain't laying down your life. You run out of your clothes. That, that disciple was probably in the room. And he's like... As soon as Jesus said, feel my hands, stare aside, it's really me. And they went, oh my goodness, it is you. The very first thing out of his mouth said, first when he said, peace be with you. The very next thing he said is, peace be to you. What's he saying? It's a different peace. He's saying, look, I know how you feel right now, Peter. But peace be to you. I don't see you for the denial. I see you for destiny. Philip, peace be with, peace be to you. Don't you be ashamed. John, I love you. Yeah? You see what he's doing? I know you all ran away, but am I not here? You're still my brother. As the Father sent me, so I send you. They ain't done one thing right up until this point. As the Father sent me, I sent you. Let us make man in our, in the image of God is what? Love. As the Father sent me, so I send you for God so that he. You hear it? What's Jesus? The redemption of man. He took us back to the beginning. So guess what he does? As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. Do you hear a limit in that? Or do you hear a just ask? And then what's he do? He breathes on them and says, receive Holy Spirit. Why? Why did he do that? Why didn't he just say receive Holy Spirit? Why did he even do that? Because how did God make man in the garden? What was lost through sin? Everything in the breath. Now his blood speaking better things. He shoots back to the earth and says, As the Father sent me, so I send you. My blood's speaking better things. Ain't nothing lost, boys. It ain't as if you ever rejected me. It's as if you've never sinned. The power of my blood has made it as if sin never happened. <sighs> Live in me. <sighs> you get it? And he said, If you forgive the sins of any, they're going to be forgiven. But if you retain the sins of any, they'll be retained. Now I'm puzzling because I don't have no scripture that says I can retain sin. I don't have permission to be in unforgiveness. I'm never to read a book by the cover or see a man for his actions. What's he saying? He ain't giving them the power to not forgive. Guess what he's saying? As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. <sighs> Receive my spirit. And if you love them, like I've just loved you. They gonna know my love. But if you get hard in your heart and you don't love and you hold man accountable for his sins, how is he ever gonna know me and my love when you represent me? Because you are the body of Christ. Now you look what's happened to people that go to church. We become legalistic in some circles. We become angry, mad. We become controlling. We become law. You think of what happened to people and all these circles and how busted up the church began, came and how many forms of the gospel are being preached and what it's produced. You can't tell me God put a corner, a church on every street corner. It's just as men haven't agreed. Just be honest. Now, I'm not saying that every church on the street corner isn't called by God. There's some that are. I'm not going to decide who is and neither do you even don't even try it. But you can't tell me God put a church on every street corner. He handed you a baton and me a baton and called us the body of Christ. And he said, the way I forgave you, you go out and forgive. And if you shut your heart and you don't give them what I gave you, how will they know me? Because you represent me. 
Now go into all the world and make disciples of men. Ain't that something? So he tells you to guard your heart with all diligence because that's where everything's going to flow from. Now you got a pastor, he gets hurt. You got a deacon, he gets hurt. You got an elder, he's offended. You got church folks, they power playing and mad and they think leadership's in control and now they just meet in their basement all hurt and wounded and six other people that agree are all sitting there and stuff happens like this. We pray for a new job because we can't stand the people we work with instead of seeing them as somebody we're supposed to love. Jesus said, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. And he breathed on him and took him back to day one where God made man in his image and said, I brought you back to the beginning as if sin never happened. Go manifest me. That's a Christian. Do you know Jesus got beat on the cross beyond recognition? Do you understand the Bible says he was marred more than any of the sons of men? That means the worst thing they ever done to a man, Jesus came out worse. Do you know they burn people on poles? Do you know witchcraft, they tie a witch, that somebody playing witchcraft, they tie her to a pole and pile a bunch of wood and burn her? You tell me you can tell if she's a boy or a girl when the fire's done. Do you know what they used to do in the Bible days? They used to soak Christians in oil. Soak them in oil all around Jerusalem. And they'd put them on poles and they'd light them, stand there and laugh as they burn. You tell me when the fire goes out and you're soaked in oil head to toe and your hair is drenched with oil and the fire comes up your body and you're screaming and burning and when that fire goes out, you tell me if you can tell who you are, if you even know if you're male or female. Jesus marred more than anybody was ever marred. That means when they were done beating him, he was so disfigured and so marred, there's no way you could tell it was him. Why? Why was it like that? Because when sin got done with man in the garden, he didn't look nothing like he was created. He had lost the image. So Jesus came and lost his image and his visage and his appearance to pay the price to get our identity back, to get Christ back on us and back in us and back through us again. You want to talk about love? Come on. That ain't opening your car door. That ain't opening your door, ladies. That's laying down your life. <laughs> Come on, we've been inconvenienced by stuff. We still do it, but it's a bother. Why couldn't they call me sooner? Man, I was right by their house 10 minutes ago. Oh, well, I'll go get him. You know what I'm saying? We still do it, but we got to let somebody know it's inconvenience. Jesus don't seem inconvenienced. Are you all with me? I preached a long time, but it was my last shot at some of you, maybe. So I just took it and I went for it. And I'm still, I'm, it's 840. I'm quitting really early. I am. I'm not even close to done. <laughs> but I said plenty. I know you heard it tonight, you great listeners. You guys are listening. I can feel it. You guys are just like, most of you like a little bird in a nest. You listen. I saw tears in a bunch of eyes in the last 20 minutes. It's just fun. I got the best seat in the house. I see you all at once, and I ain't afraid of your faces. <laughs> Do you notice how I engage and look at you all? <laughs> I appreciate Jesus, and I appreciate that you all are hungry enough for him to come here and want to go after him. And even if you didn't know me, come and hear what I had to say. I trust this weekend put something in your heart, sowed something in your heart that you continue to nurture and water and, and ask God to increase because I don't know about you above all things above all things it doesn't say above all things put on your gifting above all things put on your anointing above all things walk out your calling above all things put on love because love bond of perfection yeah I'm going to challenge you with one thing before I before I quit. There ain't one thing I said in three sessions that you can't live if you wrap faith around it and want it. Apart from any of your surface challenges, any of your physical realities, your family stuff, there ain't one thing I preach that you can't pursue if you believe. Is that fair? Is there one thing I preach that you can't go after and start to apply and believe God for there ain't one thing I called you to that you can't live by the Holy Ghost. So I guess that's why in the end it's going to come down to who believed and who didn't believe. 
And I know some people understood and didn't understand, so that's a, I don't know how that works out in, in Jesus, but God's good. But in all you're getting, get understanding. I'd rather know and have the opportunity to live what I was created for than just live in ignorance and not have that opportunity. My people are destroyed for the lack of... Now, I know we all grew up here and what you don't know won't hurt you, but that's a lie. What you don't know is destroying. I know you all grew up here and, well, if I were you, I wouldn't get my hopes up. But the Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for. It says get your hope sky high. It's the, it's hope is the, it, it, hope passes through the veil into his presence. It's the anchor of your soul. That's hope. But we grew up here and don't get your hope up. Well, you know, what you see is what you get. The Bible says don't ever believe and live by what you see. It's subject to change. The things unseen are eternal. We grew up with a total opposite language of that Bible. And it's the way that seemeth right, but it always leads to death and destruction. So let's study. Let's show ourselves approved. Let's never grow weary in well-doing. Don't take life personal. Take the gospel personal. Don't take people personal. Take the finished work personal so that you have a healthy view of men. Love lays down its life for another. The opposite of love is live at the expense of another. When you cop a bad attitude in your family, in your home, and you put pressure on them, you're living to the expense of them. You're not producing life. You're making a draw on life. Come on, let's be gentle. Let's be kind. Let's be tenderhearted. Let's be merciful. And above all things, let's put on love. Y'all good with this? Can I pray over y'all? Do you mind if I pray over y'all? Let me ask you this first. We might not have prayed for you last night. You might be here tonight, and you might not have been here last night. But you got something that you could be healed of. You got something that's bothering you in your body. There's sickness in your body. There's something going on like we prayed last night. We're just going to do the same thing. Because who sees that we had fruit last night from just believing in a simple, short, simple way? Didn't we do it quick? But it's not ineffective. Last week I was in the church. I, there's a certain way I teach it out. I didn't do that here. I still don't feel like I'm going to do that here. And it's okay. But I, we did it a certain way last week. It's just amazing how God's just... He loves when we step out and believe that it's not our prayer that heals. It's His finished work. It's His love for people. We're not under pressure. It's not about failing. It's about believing. Be healed in Jesus' name. Be made whole. It's probably plenty when there's a revelation. You don't have to accent your voice. You don't have to quote Scripture. You can just say, be whole and believe. Who knows we can all do that and be sincere. Is there anybody here tonight you would say, I got some kind of sickness in my body. I got something going on in my body. If you can, if you can, stand up. We just want to see who you are so we can surround you and believe for you and pray for you. Thank you, Lord. You know what we did last night? Could I have some people help me? Can some folks just run to somebody standing up? Just, just run to them and just say, hey, I'm going to stand with you for a couple of seconds and just believe God sincerely that you be healed right where you're standing. Just go stand, yeah, with somebody. Just grab somebody, one-on-one. -on -one. Just go stand with somebody. There's a couple back there standing. Can somebody just go stand with them and say, hey, I'm just going to agree with you for five seconds. We're going to pray together. You can't go wrong. We're just going to say, be whole in Jesus' name. Is there anybody available to run back and stand with this couple back here? Can you go, man? Good, thank you. Oh, thank you. I got people running. Good. Well, you, grab the, you grab the woman. You grab the woman. He's going to grab the man. Thank you for your patience back there. You all ready? Listen, if you stood up for prayer, this is all I want you to do right now. All I want you to do is believe one thing, that God has to love you or He'd have never sent His Son. Don't let what you're going through, what you've been challenged with, the longevity of it, don't let trials, sufferings ever question God's love. We're supposed to be rooted and grounded in love. Faith works through love. So if love's in question, we're only driven by need all the time. No, love has been settled when Christ was crucified. I'm rooted and grounded in love. The love of God is never up for debate. Circumstances don't challenge whether God loves me or not. The fact that God loves me empowers me to walk through every challenge. Can you get that? that? Let's never make that mistake. It happens a lot. Believe this tonight if we're going to pray for you. Pray for you. That God, you have you to love me, Father. Me, Father. Or you to never, never send, send your son. If you're, pray, if you're praying right for him right now, just know God is the God absolutely loves him. Like we just said, it's not your prayer. It's not your powerful prayer. You don't have to try to pray and run it. You don't have to pray long. You just be sincere in believing like a child and believe God loves him through the finished work of Christ that he'll make him whole. And all I want you to do right now, don't even ask what's going on. Just say, be whole in Jesus' name. Just go ahead. Pray that over them. Be whole in Jesus' name. No more sickness. No more symptoms. No more pain. 
in the name of Jesus be completely restored Father I thank you for healing all through this room I thank you for making people whole I thank you for no more sickness I thank you for no more pain I thank you Lord God for total healing in this room just like people raised their hands and testified last night God I thank you that you're doing that thing right now in people's bodies tonight now begin to thank God and believe that, that God's doing something right now just say thank you Father for healing me thank you for loving me Thank you for your grace in my life. Thank you for making all things new. I appreciate you healing me, Lord. I appreciate you loving on me this way. Father, in Jesus' name, I receive it and I thank you for it. Amen. And amen. Yeah? Amen. So I'm just going to believe that. You're going to walk out of here believing that. You go home tonight, talk to him, have a relationship with him. Thank you, Father, for loving me and I appreciate what you're doing in me. So I'm going to close. I just feel like I want to pray this one prayer of grace over y'all. And then we're going to just be done. And Pastor, if he wants to come up, I don't know. Or if we're just done, we're done. But I don't even know where Pastor went. But Oh, there he is. So can I just pray something over you? Father, I thank you for the great honor of just coming here and that these folks would come night after night, that three sessions they just stood here or sat here and listened. And God, I just believe it was for purpose. I believe it was for your name and your glory. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, to take every word that meant something to each person and seal it up in their heart. Bring it to their remembrance in every time of need. Use that revelation to come to their rescue, to solidify them, to make them sound and solid in you. God, I thank you where they were once weak, they'll be strong. I thank you where they were once unsure, they'll be confident. God, I thank you there's no more fork in the road. You're just putting them on that straight and narrow way. Lord God, I thank you. You're forming us in Christ through these sessions. And you're putting us on a road of transformation. And God, I thank you that you're producing love in your people. And we're going to walk in love above all things. Because it's the bond of perfection. And I just thank you for it. And I declare these things over this house and over this assembly. In the name of Jesus, I thank you for it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Pastor.